Welcome, and happy Easter on this snowy morning. We're glad you're with us to worship this morning in person or online. I'm Jean Castor, and I will be serving as your lay leader today. Blue prayer cards are located in the pew rack in front of you. If you'd like to make a prayer request, fill them out and pass it to Reverend Nathan during the opening hymn. We love to pray with you. If you're new to Covenant, we encourage you to fill out the green slip that's also in the front pew rack and place that in the offering box or hand that to Reverend Nathan. The offering box is located just outside the door at the rear of the sanctuary. We will bring these gifts forward later in the service and dedicate them to the Christ's mission. I have a couple of announcements. At the end of the service, you're welcome to take the Easter flowers home with you. Also, um, if you'll notice at the, when we generally sing the Gloria this um, Easter morning, we're singing the refrain from 238, which is Thine is the Glory. You can read more about Covenant, our current and upcoming activities, and see photos of what we do here by going to our website at wdmcovenant.org, by visiting our Facebook page, or by checking out your YouTube channel. We will now have the ringing of the Trinity chimes and introit followed by the call to worship.
This is the day when the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and celebrate in it. This is the day of new creation. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. Please stand as you are able for our opening hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, page number 232 in your hymnal. We have been buried with Christ through baptism and raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess, confess our sin. Living Lord, when we stand before the empty tomb, we don't always feel the signs of resurrection. We feel fear, doubt, and distrust. We feel empty. Forgive the fear that paralyzes us at the brink of new life. Forgive our doubt of your love. Forgive our distrust of your surprising, joyous plan. Fill our emptiness with your glorious light. Raise us to abundant new life for the glory of your name.
on Jesus' authority by the power of the Holy Spirit, I declare that we are forgiven. We are forgiven. Hallelujah. Beloved siblings, children of God, may the peace of Christ be with you. Please greet one another with a sign of peace. Peace be with you. I want to invite uh, any kids who are with us this morning. If you want to, you are welcome to come all the way forward. I want you to know that you are invited to hear the very best story ever, which you're going to hear in just a minute. So any kids who want to come up, I do also have a show and tell that you have to be up here to see very well. So... So that's a little, little extra. Come on up. You can just have a seat right here on this front pew. Or in front of the front pew. That works too. Oh. Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter. Hey, I have... Um, I usually do a show and tell. If you worship with us regularly, you've seen me do show and tell, and I do a show and tell for everybody to get to see, but every so often I like to have one that only you get to see. So, it is a very small show and tell here. Who can identify my show and tell? Jelly beans. Jelly beans, that's right. And the classic jelly beans, not that gourmet stuff, right? These are... <laughs> These are your standard colors of jelly bean, right? Um, and sometimes we use these jelly beans, not these very jelly beans, we're only doing that today. Um, sometimes we use these classic jelly beans as a way of remembering the story that we are about to read today for Easter. Okay? Um, and it's more than just the story that Jean's about to read for us. So I'm going to tell you about more of the story, but I'm going to also give you this fun little jelly bean poem. Um, this is a new improved jelly bean poem that my colleague Emmy put together. So there you all are. There are additional copies of the jelly bean poem and additional jelly beans back in the fellowship hall. You can grab those during coffee hour. All right, so here's the story that sets up the story that Jean's about to read, okay? Are you ready? Are you excited? This is, this is a good deal. All right, so we have a red jelly bean that helps us remember the Thursday night part of the story. Jesus ate 
a meal before the Passover celebration. That was a special holiday that Jesus and his followers celebrated. And he used bread and wine. Sometimes wine is not usually this exact shade of red, but sometimes wine is red. Um, he uses bread and wine to point to the promises of God's kingdom, love and forgiveness. So red helps us remember that. Then we've got this green jelly bean that reminds us that after that meal, Jesus went to a garden to pray. And while he was praying, one of his disciples, one of his followers, came with a group of soldiers and arrested Jesus. And this yellow jelly bean helps us remember that Jesus was on trial in front of a Roman governor. And the Roman governor couldn't find any reason to convict Jesus, but he convicted him anyway and condemned him to die. And then while that was happening, this purple jelly bean reminds us of a purple robe that the soldiers put on Jesus. It was a pretend royal robe to pretend, oh, look, he's like a king, and we're about to put him to death. Well, Jesus is a king, but he's a very different kind of king than the kind that we think about. Then this orange jelly bean helps us remember the sky behind Jesus as he was being crucified. Some of the stories in the Bible tell us about the sky. Even though it was the middle of the day, the sky got really dark like sunset as Jesus was dying. And even there on that cross, Jesus was connecting people to each other into a new family. And Jesus died. And two of his followers took his body down from the cross and they wrapped it up in white wrappings so that they could lay him in a tomb. And on Sunday morning, the tomb was dark, dark, dark inside. And inside that tomb is where the mystery of this story happens. So we are waiting for that story. Can I sit right up there with you and we can listen to this really great story? Let us pray. Living God, we joy, we celebrate the presence of your risen word, enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the New Testament, John 20, 1 through 10. Please join me in reading that. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. 
the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Ellen could barely breathe as she walked into the sanctuary. She walked past where she and Bill always used to sit. Her sister and her nephews were right behind her all the way up to the front row of the sanctuary. Ellen's breath had left her when they closed the casket. That action cemented what, of course, she already knew, that Bill was gone, and that body, that was no longer him. 
She'd felt it all that week, of course. She had felt it coming on during those months of caregiving, but those months of caregiving and those years of partnership, they were all gone now, just gone, and no one knew where they, where they had gone. It seemed like they buried Ellen that day, too. She took an unhappy early retirement. She pulled back from her neighborhood association. She couldn't even go to the theater anymore. Ellen gave her canoe to somebody else's grandkids. She knew how to paddle solo, of course, but it wasn't the same with Bill's seat empty. She muddled on as best she could. She stayed in the church choir, and her women's circle kept an eye on her as best they could. But Bill's absence, it was just drowning her. He was gone, and she didn't know where. And then out of the blue, the youth director called her. He was looking for some adults to chaperone a youth summer camping trip. Picture it, 10 days in the wilderness with 20 teenagers. <laughs> Ellen could not imagine enjoying that, but it was the loving thing to do, and so she said yes. She knew what she was doing in the wilderness, of course, and she got along well enough with the other adult leaders, and the kids entertained themselves, mostly. But she was still so deeply missing Bill, and he was still gone. Then on the seventh day of the trip, Casey asked Ellen if they could talk. And so they went about 100 feet down the shore from the camp, and they sat on a rock. They were safely visible, but they were too far away to be heard. And Casey took a deep breath and said, I need someone to understand. I need someone to understand. My parents, they are trying so hard to love me, and they just don't know how to. I just need someone. And Ellen wasn't quite sure why Casey trusted her, but she did. And so Ellen took in her fear and her anguish and her clarity, and she marveled at her courage and strength. And that night during devotions, Ellen sat separately away and just prayed Casey's name over and over again. God, I don't know where you are. I haven't known where you are for a long time, but here Casey is. I need you to see her. The first Easter proclamation was a lot like that. They've taken my Lord, and we don't know where they've laid him. I don't know where you are, but I know what I'm looking for. Mary Magdalene was so deep in grief it was like she might drown. It had only been a weekend since Jesus died, and there was no funeral, not even one without him. It was only because of some rich men's connections that they even had a body that wasn't Jesus anymore. Mary was still numb from the whirlwind of that last week, the cheering crowds and the enigmatic teachings and then the arrest and the trial and the unjust condemnation and the death. And every step along the way, Jesus' love for the world just poured out of him. And you couldn't miss it, but there was no way to absorb it all. It was just too much. And now he was gone. That's where a lot of us start Easter morning. What is the good news of the resurrection for those of us who don't know where Jesus is? That body in the tomb, that's not Jesus. His life is not there. His spirit is gone. It's just a body. Only it's not even in the tomb. We knew exactly where Jesus was. The one thing we knew even though he wasn't there, we at least knew where he was, but now we don't even know that. And it's the strangest thing. Whoever took Jesus' body, whoever these grave robbers are, they 
folded up the linen sheets that Jesus had been wrapped in. It's not like Jesus got taken at all. It's like he checked out of a hotel or he broke camp. Jesus is not just gone. Jesus left. Jesus is not just gone. Jesus left. And Mary couldn't see it yet, but there was another disciple on the scene who did see it. Another disciple who looked in the tomb that Jesus had vacated and believed. That belief, that's not certainty, that's not even clarity about exactly what has happened. This disciple was as lost as anyone, but they started to realize if Jesus is not in the tomb and we don't know where he is, he could be anywhere. He could be anywhere. That's the first Easter good news. We don't know where Jesus is, and he could be anywhere. That uncertainty, that confusion, it turns into hope in that moment. Now, for the next several weeks, we will read in worship different moments when Jesus' followers found him, or when Jesus found his followers. Different appearances of this risen Christ to his followers, different moments when the people realized that Christ is indeed risen. And every one of those testimonies adds another layer to our understanding of what happened that morning, but more importantly, what happens still today. For 2,000 years, the church's mission and proclamation have found the risen Christ again and again and again. And all of those teachings and all of that testimony, they begin right here at an empty tomb. We don't know where Jesus is. He could be anywhere. Ellen found Jesus that evening on the shore of the lake, and her name was Casey, and she was desperate for someone to hear her, desperate for someone to show her love. So when they got back out of the woods, Ellen began going to Casey's concerts, and with her parents' permission, they met up for coffee, and Casey's parents knew that Ellen could hear something from Casey that they weren't yet ready to hear. And when Casey went to prom, Ellen was there, and Casey looked absolutely radiant. And her parents said they had never, ever seen her that happy. And then it hit Ellen so hard she couldn't breathe. Bill's smile, the smile that she was sure she would never, ever see again. There it was on Casey's face. Casey's parents turned to Ellen and hugged her and said, thank you. We honestly wondered whether Casey was going to survive through high school. You have raised her from the dead. And Ellen said, no, she raised me from the dead. That's the resurrection. The Lord is gone from the tomb, and we don't know where he is. The life of Christ is on the loose, and we never know where we will find it, even today. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to join in singing our second hymn, number 239, Good Christians All Rejoice and Sing.
Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. One of the ways that we believe what we have not seen is by praying for what we need and what the life of this world needs. So we lift up prayers today for Bob Rees as he is fighting COVID. We pray for Marlene, Perry Van Tassel's mother, as she awaits testing for an intestinal tumor. We pray for Harold Storjahan, Rick Storjahan's dad, who is hospitalized this week after a stroke and a heart attack. We pray for his strength that he might return home. And we pray for the new life and the new beginnings that are made possible by Christ's resurrection. Christ is risen, and so we pray. Lord of life, God of empty tombs, we praise you this Easter day. O Lord, you are for us our strength and our song, for you have become our salvation. We give thanks to you and we pray to you, O Lord, for you are good. Your mercy endures forever. We sing with gladness, for you have triumphed over death itself, and so we entrust to you all who have died, and we put our hope in Christ's resurrection. Hold us when we grieve and claim your people for life. We pray to you, O Lord, for you are good. Your mercy endures forever. We give you thanks, O Lord, for you have opened the gates of righteousness. You have freed us from all fear and worry, so we might serve you by serving our neighbor in your name. Teach us your will and lead us in your ways. We pray to you, O Lord, for you are good. Your mercy endures forever. We proclaim your salvation, the gift of wholeness, in our relationships, our bodies, and our souls. We continue to seek your redemption for the broken and rejected parts of our lives. Work your healing for all we have lifted up, for Bob, for Marlene, for Harold, and build us up once more in your marvelous love. We pray to you, O Lord, for you are good. Your mercy endures forever. We rejoice in the gift of this day, the day of your triumph, and we give thanks for all those through the years who have proclaimed the good news of your salvation. Unite us with each other and with your people in Christ throughout the world that we might bear witness to your grace. We pray to you, O Lord, for you are good. Your mercy endures forever. Your mercy is eternal, O Lord, and we give you thanks now and always in the name of the risen Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Because we love Jesus, our good shepherd, we are called to feed his sheep. We participate in that work of feeding Christ's sheep through all of the offerings that we present to God. The offering plate, again, is just inside the back door of the sanctuary. If you missed it, you are certainly welcome to run up here after the service. Uh, We will present those uh, offerings in just a moment. Every year on Easter Sunday, we dedicate the One Great Hour of Sharing special offering. We've collected this offering using these special envelopes that are in the back of the pews in front of you, other envelopes in the bulletins, and those famous little fish banks that the kids have used during Lent. 
One Great Hour of Sharing supports Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and self-development of people to provide people with safety, sustenance, and hope. Susan Crable is PDA's Associate for Refugees and Asylum, and she discussed where we are looking for the risen Christ among the large number of refugees and displaced people due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Susan says, this is a crisis situation. People are running for their lives. There is damage all across the country. Even people not directly impacted by the violence have lost access to water, electricity, all sorts of basic needs. PDA is working alongside ecumenical partners with deep roots in the region who know how to work in partnership with the locals so they can get the aid where it's needed. In addition to giving, Susan says, we can pray for those who are impacted. We can advocate for peace. Peace talks haven't yet been successful, but we need to keep up hope because, as we said earlier, people eventually really want to go home, and that means peace. Susan thanks us for faithfully supporting the One Great Hour of Sharing special offering. She says, it gives us readiness to respond when a crisis comes up. We often say the church may not be the first one in, but we are often the last one out. We know this will be a long-term response. We pray for peace and protection for all refugees and displaced people, and we pray that we may recognize the risen Christ among them. And so, with joy and hope, we dedicate our offering. I invite you to stand and join in singing our doxology. Let us pray. We exult in your love, O God of the living, for you made the tomb of death the womb from which you bring forth your Son, the firstborn of a new creation. Through these gifts, let us be joyful witnesses to this good news, that all humanity may rejoice in the miracle of resurrection. Amen. I invite you to remain standing and join in singing hymn number 233, The Day of Resurrection.
Rejoice. Christ is risen and is ascending to God. Go into the world and tell the good news so that everyone who believes may know life in his name. May the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be your life and hope forever. Alleluia. Amen.